you oh good good ah yes hello old boy do do come and join me let's just bring you a bit closer to the map here splendid well oh, God, these things are a pain in this heat comfortable comfortable journey i trust excellent well welcome to singapore and more specifically welcome to fort canning so you're probably wondering why you've been sent here after all the real war is uh, east of uh, west of suez is it not well out here we do have problems of our own and i'll give you some clue as to why you have been sent out here and why london thinks this place is so important this is our operational area malay peninsula fortress and naval base of singapore now, I don't know whether you've read any briefings or been privy to what the state of play is out here. No. What are the papers saying? Really? Ha <laughs> ha, how entertaining. Singapore, mighty Singapore, impregnable fortress and all that, eh? Ah, oh, if only. I'm afraid, old son, you'll have to get used to some home truths that might be rather uncomfortable. Don't worry. I shall let you down gently. Singapore is indeed a fortress, fear you not. And if the Japanese are obliging enough to attempt a landing round here from the sea, we shall have ample opportunity to test our defences, and I've no doubt they will do well. There's only one slight problem. Have no doubt the Japanese are coming. Secondly, I doubt that they're going to be so obligingly stupid. Not when they have this entire peninsula from which to pick a landing spot. And also, neutral and yet unreliable Thailand above that is another area we're going to have to watch. What you've been hearing about this place is not totally unfounded. We do have powerful forces here. We'll soon have over a hundred thousand men if reinforcements continue to come in at the rate they've been arriving. That's quite enough for a fortress, surely? All is not as it seems. Some of our units are superb. The Stuarts and Argyles will impress you with their jungle craft. And between that and their superb equipment, I have no doubt that they will give the Japanese a run for their money. Others may need a bit more knocking into shape. With large contingents from the Indian Army, the Dominion of Australia sending troops as well. But they're not really accustomed to the conditions here. Some of them are very new troops and not all of them have received their full quota of equipment. It's going to take a while to bring them up to spec, and that's where officers of your rank, your position, come in. We won't have much time. We will have air cover. As you can see from the map, the old RAF has ensured that plenty of large, well-equipped airfields were built, covering the coast of the entire peninsula. They will be our first line of defence. But don't be too reassured by the sight of all those airfields. The RAF has barely enough planes to man them. We've been allocated somewhat over a hundred aircraft for the defence of this entire area, and believe you me, that is not a lot. Somewhat under half of these are fighters. Now, I've not seen these new American Brewsters in action myself, but I have no doubt but if it comes to it, they'll hold the Japanese off, at least for a while. I'm not pegging too much hopes on those old wildebeest torpedo bombers, though. I have a horrible feeling they might live up to their name, especially if we can't escort them. The Navy's pitching in too. Not for nothing is there an expensive naval base down there. What's that you say? Main fleet to Singapore. Oh, you've heard that one, have you? Well, in a manner of speaking, yes. 
What I'm about to tell you is to be kept strictly under your hat for now, old boy. We will be lucky if we receive a dozen ships. And from what I understand, only two of them are liable to be capital ships. We may receive an aircraft carrier, but there's no guarantee of that. Uh, I'm not allowed to discuss why, but we may not be so fortunate. The Navy, I'm sure, will do its best, but we cannot rely on them to prevent a Japanese landing. What happens if the Japanese do land? Well, we are stuck with a bit of an intractable strategic problem. Those RAF air bases need to be defended. They need to be kept in our hands. Some of them are built on decidedly indefensible terrain, but we have to try to hold them. They're not in locations where we can mutually support each other, and it's inevitable that some of the troops we commit to their defence may be less than reliable. We are going to have to rely very heavily on positional warfare in the fight that's coming. And pray that the Japanese remain relatively unaware of our weaknesses. I must stress, London regards it as vital that this colony is kept going. Business as usual, because this area here supplies a very large proportion of rubber and the tin that we require for our war effort. At all costs, Singapore must be held. If at all possible, the Malay Peninsula must be held with it. London feels that we have sufficient resources for the task. Personally, I have some doubts. But it's up to us. And very soon there might not be anybody else. So to your post. Get to know your men. You'll receive orders fairly shortly, detailing your position. And good luck. And, uh, ooh, if you're not too exhausted after your journey, the raffles will be open for another couple of hours. If you haven't had a chance to avail yourself of a stunner and a tiffin, now might be a good chance to do it. Where, you say? Ah, come with me. So, you are here. Good. Please be seated. I shall just prepare some of the materials. Lights. Excellent. Are we all here? Good. Mark this well, gentlemen. The Malay Peninsula. Singapore. Jewels in the crown of Britain's ill-gotten Eastern Empire. This place is vital for our empire. It is necessary for our expansion when we seize it and the rest of the southern resources area. The rubber and tin this rich colony produces for its British masters will far greater serve us. And in return for liberation, the peoples of these lands will gladly transfer their allegiance to our beloved Emperor. The base at Singapore and the airfields in the region will serve us and they will serve as a springboard for our future moves into the Dutch East Indies. But make no mistake, the British will not relinquish this colony easily. Even now they are pouring vast reserves of men to hold this area large numbers of British troops, even larger contingents of their Indian and Australian lackeys are taking up positions. They fear that we are coming. They are right to do so. And they are preparing. The Royal Navy 
will soon be dispatching units to Singapore. And the Royal Air Force already has a presence in all the bases along the coastline. But where they think they are strong, they are in fact weak. There are large numbers of troops belie men of uneven training and uneven quality. We do not know the composition of their naval task force, but I have no doubt that our Navy will meet them and destroy them by whatever means is necessary and most expeditious to our plans. Our Army Air Force will sweep the peninsula clear. Between them and our naval flyers, we bring 600 aircraft to this campaign. And I've no doubt that the superiority of our aircraft and the superb training of our pilots will carry the day. Most importantly of all, we have an indomitable warrior spirit with which we shall conquer our unequal foe. We serve an emperor who is a living God and against whom no enemy can stand. This will most certainly not be an easy fight, but great glory awaits us. And not just that, by your actions in the coming campaign, you will add great luster to our already glorious empire. You will play a vital role in the furtherance of the Kukutai, the national polity. And you will secure for our beloved emperor an essential part of our dream of a greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, the expulsion of the foreign imperialists and its replacement by a new glorious dawn ushered in by the empire of the rising sun. So to your posts, see to your men, be sure of your weaponry, the battles ahead will be hard fought, but in the end, victory will be ours. Tenno Heka, Banzai! <laughs> oh, hello. Someone's left the lights on in here. Anyway, hello. Uh, welcome back to the channel. Um, today, I'd like to introduce you to a new game that's crossed my um, my desk, my gaming table, whatever, and it is Claws of the Tiger, designed by Steve Pohl. I've heard very good things about this game. Um, I'm still wading my way through the rules, and I cannot wait to try it, because the, the Malaya campaign is one that I've had a deep, deep interest in for many years. And of course, the fall of Singapore has that terrible gripping pathos about it. There's nothing quite like a military disaster to really get you interested. Um, so both from the British and the Japanese perspectives, there's a lot of interest there. Now, in some respects, this is like a lot of the other games out there that deal with the, uh, the, the Malaya-Singapore campaign. You've got the standard map of the Malay Peninsula. You've got Singapore, mighty Singapore down there. Um, the Japanese objective is, of course, to seize that. The British objective is to stop them. And a lot of what's going to happen is going to boil down to the actions that are fought down the peninsula. But this is a game with a difference. Uh, designers said quite openly that this isn't going to be a heavy-duty war game. This is, this is very much what he calls a beer and pretzels game. So you can supposedly play this in a couple of hours. And then if you want a rematch, you can play again. Now, the map is gorgeous, love the artwork. Very frequent complaint is place names. I grew up here, so, you know, when they get place names wrong, it kind of, you know, 
we, we've known about this campaign a long time. Lots of books have been written about it. So when the important town of Gamas ends up being called Gunras, you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, minor quibble, beautiful map. I'm going to shut up about that for now. Claws of the Tiger. And there's a gorgeous, gorgeous picture on the front of the game for you tiger lovers out there. Uses a very interesting system that pretty much relies on deception. So if I hold up the counter sheet, um, as you'd expect, there's a lot of counters um, for infantry, for artillery, for armour. Um, aircraft and the naval side are abstracted for this game. The Japanese get certain advantages, uh, which are built in by the rules to reflect how well their air forces did historically and how rapidly, sadly, they got rid of the British naval force Z. So it's all about the ground war. But you do not place these fellows on the map. That's the interesting thing. The only thing that goes on the map are these force markers. And what they do is they act as a location marker for all of these fellows who are held off map. So there's wonderful opportunities for players to conduct maneuvers. Um, the opponent only has a vague idea of where they are. And it ties in with a combat system, which is quite unlike any I've seen before. There's a couple of layers of math and dice rolling to it, but nothing more complex than you get from I don't know, a fairly simple war game. But what I like about it is that there are dice rolls involved and the attacker, usually, or the Japanese side, is able to benefit slightly more than the, the defender that accounts for the superior Japanese mobility. But either way, both forces will find that their units are not fully engaged when two of them meet in battle. So let's say there's an engagement outside Kwantan. You might have, say, the Japanese Force A crashing into the British Force F. The actual strength of those forces will be recorded off map using these counters. But a roll of the dice determines how many of these strength points actually end up fighting each other. So the beauty of that system is that you might mass your troops, but bad weather, poor communications, poor terrain or, or inadequate knowledge of the terrain might blunt your attack by simply causing some of your units to not make contact. Now, this can be a good and a bad thing because the other effect of this is that if you don't end up engaging with your full force, the opposition may receive a false picture of how strong you actually are. And this, in turn, can cut both ways. He might see your full strength and think, oh my word, I don't like this, I'm getting out of here, and then attempt to retreat. Or he might gain a false sense of security if your first attack proves weak and he goes, huh, this lot are a bit of a pushover, aren't they? We'll hold them off forever. And then, sadly, for him, the next turn, you roll a bit better and your entire force crashes into his defensive line and he hasn't the faintest idea what hit him. It's marvellous. Now, purists and grognards might be slightly un upset by the fact that there are no historical unit designations. It is pure strength points. Uh, and yes, I've got to admit that that did throw me a bit to begin with. What? There's no... There's no differentiation between Australians and Indians and, and even the occasional Brit on the British side. Oh, my God, there's no there's no counter for Dal Force. <sighs> and on the Japanese side, I mean, who are the 5th Division? Who are the 18th Division? Who, for heaven's sake, are the Imperial Guards Division? If only because in the light of revisionist history, you want to mark them down a bit. They're not supermen. I'd, I'd throw my lot in with the 5th or the 18th any day. But no, there is none of that. What you see is what you get. But it makes for a really interesting game because I find, just from reading the rules, your, your thought process automatically becomes different. You don't blindly follow the Japanese plan uh, and you also don't 
tend to commit units to their historical um, deployments. There's a tendency for us to want to do that sometime. This game offers us a wonderful chance to break out of that mindset. Your troops are just there expressed in strength points. Allocate them how you will within certain historical limitations and go for it. Um, I like the counters. They're nice, thick, chunky things that will last a good while. The finish is nice. Um, I've already commented on the artwork of the map. The rules are good. About eight pages of actual rules, an extended example of play, which is really, really helpful. And a couple of sheets for players to hold their off-map forces. Most appealingly, this will be true of many gamers, there is a solo variant allowing the British player to try and fight the Japanese um, invasion off. Now sadly there is no Japanese solo scenario. The, uh, the designer was quite frank in admitting that it's very difficult to put all the variables of Japanese, uh, of British, sorry, decision making into a coherent form that works. But of course he welcomes any suggestions if people try this out and find something that works. He would be very interested to know. Um, I'm going to put a link in the uh, description to White Dog Games. This is not their only game. They've manufactured some really, really amazing titles. Um, and I would recommend checking their website out. I have played one or two of their other games before and enjoyed them. I'm pretty sure I'm going to enjoy Claws of the Tiger and fairly soon I'll be putting up another video with an example of play just to show you how the game functions. But in the meantime, um, I really look forward to giving this a whirl. Thank you very much for tuning into the channel today and um, I shall be back with hopefully a tense and hard fought battle to either take or save Fortress Singapore. Thank you.